guess we'll get started. Uh, so welcome to the IMA Data Science Seminar. Um, so uh, we're very happy today to have Matt Jacobs um, here to give a talk. So uh, Matt got his PhD from the University of Michigan um, in 2017, and he was a, a postdoc at uh, UCLA after that. Um, and he's now at uh, Purdue as an assistant professor. Um, so he's uh, he's here to talk today sorry, about, um, about adversarial training uh, and the generalized Wasserstein uh, Barry Center problem. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, having me. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, adversarial training um, and this connection that we found between adversarial training and what we're calling this generalized uh, Wasserstein Barry Center problem. So we're going to have some uh, basically classes and we're going to find some kind of Barry Center in this Wasserstein space. And this is going to be related to adversarial training. Um, and uh, this is joint work with uh, Nicholas Garcia Trios, who's at uh, Madison, and uh, his PhD student, uh, Jack Wong Kim. Okay, so let me just start off by talking a little bit about uh, adversarial training, where it's coming from, um, and sort of the, the original motivation are these things called adversarial attacks. So you kind of have some very well-trained uh, neural net and it's doing a great job at classification. But then what happens is you have some adversary that comes in and tries to mess things up. So it gets to do something to an image that you are inputting into this neural network, uh, essentially something that is basically completely imperceptible. So if we uh, just look at what we have here, uh, there's this picture that's very clearly a panda. Uh, you add this tiny bit of stuff, which basically looks like random noise. Um, and uh, right, you're, you're essentially multiplying this random noise by a very small number. You add it to the image of the panda. It still looks exactly like a panda, but now your neural network thinks it's a gibbon um, with absurdly high confidence. Um, and what I should also say is, even though this thing looks like uh, random noise, it's actually an attack that is chosen very specifically by this adversary. And essentially what it's doing is some kind of uh, gradient ascent on the loss function for this neural net. Um, so it's sort of finding the best possible perturbation to really mess things up. Um, and so this has been around for, you know, these ideas have been around for a while. Uh, this this figure is taken from a paper uh, from 2015, a very famous paper, I should say, from uh, 2015. Um, okay, here's here's one other uh, example, which um, is actually sort of like with uh, something that exists in the real world. So obviously, people have been very interested in creating, uh, you know, computer vision systems for self-driving cars. And these sort of things are also vulnerable to adversarial attacks. So uh, what these people did is they actually figured out how to place stickers on this stop sign to convince whatever computer vision system uh, that was supposed to, you know, see this thing as a stop sign that it's actually something completely different, you know, potentially a uh, green light, which obviously would be extremely dangerous. Um, so, you know, when you're deploying uh, machine learning systems out in the real world, in any sort of application that could be security critical, uh, you really, really have to be worried about these adversarial attacks because they can potentially do uh, really bad things. Um, the one thing that I don't know what's going on in this image is I don't know why this stop sign is just randomly in some hallway. Uh, it might be where these people work. I guess that's that's the uh, adversarial feature of this image to humans. Um, I mean, I think, I don't know exactly how they figured out uh, how to do it, but I, I think essentially they just wanted to say, all right, we're the only thing that we can kind of do reasonably is place some stickers on here. And then they probably did some kind of like trial and error with uh, maybe a gradient ascent on this thing. Um, yeah, to figure out where these should go. Um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's also uh, completely possible. Yeah, but I, I think they wanted to sort of find attacks that could actually be carried out in the real world. Yeah. Um, right. And, and again, right, like to a human, it's very clear that this is a stop sign. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's uh, that's sort of. Um, you know, the primer on these adversarial attacks. And, and I think one really important question that a lot of people have been thinking about is like, why is there so much uh, vulnerability to these attacks, which, you know, don't f fool a human at all. Um, and, you know, some people have thought it's, it's related to the structure of neural networks themselves. Um, but actually, uh, there's been some other ideas. And um, kind of the one that I find the most convincing is that essentially when you're training a neural net, you're just trying to maximize accuracy, right? Or, or minimize your loss function. Um, and so you're asking it to find every possible feature that it could, it could find that will uh, have some predictive accuracy. And uh, there's this paper by Madri that actually suggests that... Um, these models can learn features that are very, very highly predictive, but they're just not robust. Um, and so, you know, for example, with this panda image, um, you could imagine that one of the things that it learns, which is highly predictive, is something about the fur texture. Um, and again, that's probably not very robust. Potentially, you change this fur texture a little bit, and it thinks it's this uh, given monkey instead of a panda. Um, uh, but they, they, this paper actually has a lot of uh, experiments where they kind of show that if you do training on, um, you know, just uh, images you get out in the wild, you're going to have these highly predictive uh, but not robust features. Um, and you can try to clean those things out. And then actually you're much more robust to uh, some adversarial attacks. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I highly recommend that paper. It's very interesting. Um, so yeah, there's, there's been a lot of questions about, uh, or sorry, a lot of work trying to understand why. Um, but, you know, another perhaps more important thing is, well, what can we actually do about it? What can we, you know, what can we do to protect against these uh, adversarial attacks? And um, there have been a lot of ideas, but what's really become the most influential uh, is this idea of adversarial training, where instead of uh, just trying to maximize um, accuracy or minimize loss when you are training your neural net um, or whatever machine learning system you wanna work with, you're going to introduce the adversary into the training process. And so your classifier has to fight against this adversary uh, while you're training. And that essentially forces you to learn more robust information about your data set. If you learn information that is not robust, then uh, this adversary is going to immediately defeat you. Um, and so the way I have it set up here, um, uh, these thetas are sort of the uh, parameters of your classifier. Um, and here I'm maximizing over them. So this is a little bit different from what people typically do in machine learning where they usually think about this as minimizing a loss function. Here, I just wanna think about it as maximizing accuracy. So it, it's completely equivalent, um, but we'll see in a little bit uh, why um, it's a little bit more convenient to formulate it this way. Um, and uh, these FIs are going to be my classifier for class I. This mu I is the data distribution for class I. And here I'm just looking at some kind of zero one uh, I guess here I would call it a zero one gain rather than a zero one loss, where I'm just trying to align the classifier FI against the data distribution mu I, right? So I wanna try to maximize that thing. And then what this adversary gets to do is uh, inside of the problem, it gets to perturb the data points. So I have some data point X in my distribution and uh, I have some adversarial budget epsilon, which is going to tell me how far is this adversary allowed to perturb points. And so the adversary sees this point X 
and it gets to choose a new point x twiddle, which is sort of designed to be the one that's going to mess up the current classifier the most. Um, are there any questions about this setup? Okay. Okay, um, and then there have been some uh, generalizations of uh, these ideas. So there are some uh, features of that previous model that are a little bit uh, mathematically problematic. Um, and you can kind of get rid of this by uh, sort of just thinking about everything a little bit more distributionally. And so instead of saying that the adversary has the power to just attack data points, you can think about it instead as what the adversary is allowed to do is it's allowed to take the original data distribution and replace it with some new data distribution. That's going to be this uh, mu i twiddle. Um, but this mu i twiddle needs to be close to the original data distribution. And that's what this distance d is going to measure. So we're just going to say that d uh, between mu i and mu i twiddle has to be less than or equal to this uh, adversarial budget um, epsilon. Um, and for example, you could choose some uh, distance, this w infinity distance. Uh, and what that essentially does is it says that um, each individual point can only move uh, a certain amount, or you're essentially only going to measure the maximal distance that you moved a point. And so if you say W infinity between these two measures is less than or equal to epsilon, you're essentially recovering that first problem that we looked at. Um, and you can also uh, generalize this even further where you sort of think about um, the adversary just has to pay some cost when it changes uh, the data distribution. Um, and again, you can recover these previous problems by using some kind of zero infinity type penalty, but you can also think about more general things as well. Um, and for people who are familiar with uh, optimal transport, this last problem, DRO prime, looks very much like an optimal transport kind of problem because I have these two data distributions. I have some cost that I'm going to define between them. Typically, this is going to be some kind of Wasserstein distance. Um, and then uh, this new distribution is just getting integrated against some uh, function. Um, and this is a problem that shows up a lot in uh, optimal transport. Um, and so already at this stage, it's, it's sort of clear that there has to be some connection between uh, this adversarial training and optimal transport. Um, and so it's, it's this last version of the problem that I'm going to uh, pretty much focus on for the rest of this talk. Okay, so essentially the things that uh, we would like to understand are sort of these three questions. Um, you know, the first one is what are we, what is adversarial training actually doing? Um, you know, we have some sense that the adversary is trying to find these attacks that mess things up the most uh, that they can. What are those attacks really? And then in what sense uh, is this helping to regularize my classifier? So how is the classifier responding to the presence of this adversary? Um, and the, the second question is, what is this trade-off that you get between accuracy and robustness? So as soon as you introduce the adversary into your system, you're not going to have, or you're going to lose some accuracy in your classifier because you're sort of saying, well, I don't want to necessarily, uh, I don't want to be as accurate as I can at the expense of robustness. Um, and, you know, if you just sort of look at these optimization problems, once you throw this inf over the adversary in there, you're going to get a smaller value. Um, and so there's this trade-off between the accuracy of your answer and the robustness that you get. And of course, this is related to this last thing of how do you properly choose this uh, adversarial budget epsilon? Um, and this is, I think, a hyperparameter that can be quite hard to uh, tune when you actually want to do this training. Um, and uh, so um, 
Nicholas and uh, some of his other collaborators have thought about this a lot in the uh, binary case where you just have two classes. Um, but the two class case is actually quite different from the multi class case. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of this is this multi class case of uh, adversarial training. Um, and I'll try to give some answers to these three questions, but there's still a lot that needs to be understood. Um, and so in some sense, what I'm talking about today is kind of just like the first step towards trying to answer uh, these questions. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to consider this in a little bit of a relaxed and easier setting. So rather than talking about uh, adversarial training in the context of neural nets or in the context of some kind of specific uh, machine learning system, we're going to look at the non-parametric case, which essentially just means I'm allowed to choose any possible probabilistic classifier when I do this. Um, and this is going to simplify the problem. So uh, compared to that problem that I showed you guys before, the only difference now is uh, these classifiers F, we're just taking the supremum over the set of all possible probabilistic classifiers. So F is just some function that's defined on the set of labels and the data space X, we're just saying, we're thinking of these F sub i's as representing your confidence that the point X uh, belongs to class I, so you sum up over all of these things, it should be less than or equal to one. Um, and uh, once you set it up this way, this sort of sum uh, where you integrate the FIs against the mu i's and sum up over the i's, that is your total classification accuracy. Um, and so for instance, if you divide this by the sum of the masses of uh, each of these data distributions, that gives you sort of your percentage accuracy. Um, and uh, that, that particular number will be important later. So just keep in mind that that first term is precisely the classification accuracy that you expect to get. Um, and yeah, this is really the key. The learner is allowed to choose any measurable function that is a probabilistic classifier. And this makes the problem, well, let me get to that in one second. So that's what the uh, learner gets to do. And then you're sort of pitting it against this adversary, right? Who gets to choose this new data distribution, mu twiddle. And what they want to do is they want to make that sum of the FIs integrated against the mu i's small. But again, they have to pay this adversarial cost. And so they also want to make that cost small. Uh, for the most part, um, I will be thinking about this zero infinity cost, which really just says you can move every individual data point some distance epsilon, uh, where you can define the distance function on the space X to be whatever you want it to be. Um, but uh, of course you can, you can consider more general Cs. Uh, but this, this is really the one that people care about for, for uh, adversarial training. Okay. So the, this is the two setup of these things sort of fighting against each other. Um, and the key is that when you do this relaxation to consider all possible probabilistic classifiers, you now have a, a concave convex problem. Um, S is itself a convex set. Um, you know, the problem with parametric classifiers is that they're almost never convex with respect to your parameters. Um, so S is now a convex set. Mu also lives in a convex set. The two variables uh, just interact with each other in a bilinear pairing. So that's good for um, min-max problems. And then this cost term uh, where you're plugging in the mu i twiddles, that is convex with respect to mu i twiddle. And so overall, you have a convex concave uh, min-max problem. And so that means that you can uh, interchange the order of this min and max. Um, the reason you want to do this is once you switch the order, the maximization with respect to F is actually completely point-wise. 
And that means that you can explicitly write down what you get. Um, and so that, that significantly uh, simplifies things. So we're going to interchange. We're going to do the maximization over F. And then we're going to get a pure minimization problem for the adversary. Um, and that's the problem that we're going to try to understand. OK, so we do this interchange. And we ask, well, what, what, what does F want to do? So the only constraints that we have on F is that each of the F sub i's are greater than or equal to zero, and they have to sum up to one uh, when you sum across the i's. And so actually the best thing to do at any data point is to just say, well, I'm going to put all of that um, probability just on whichever label has the largest amount of mass at that point, right? And so once you uh, maximize over F, what it turns into is actually a, a point-wise maximization of each one of these data distributions. Okay, so, um, right. Once you get rid of F, the second line is what the problem becomes. Um, and the important thing here is if all of these mu i twiddles have disjoint mass, then, you're essentially actually just gonna recover the sum of each of these when you do this thing. And that means that in that case, the learner gets 100% uh, accuracy. So if these mu i twiddles have disjoint support, the adversary has completely failed. Um, they're not getting any of the things that they want out of it. And so in some sense, what the adversary wants to do is it wants to make these classes overlap. So if I had two classes that were previously disjoint, I now move them on top of each other. I take a max of each of these two things. There's some total amount of mass that's gonna be lost because the learner can only see one of these two things once they're on top of each other. Um, that's sort of the idea. So let me try to illustrate that some more with this toy example. And so what's happening here is we have three classes, the red, the green, and the blue points. And um, it, you know, the three classes are all just a single data point that's a delta measure. And then these omega threes are just the weights of how much mass are at these points. And we ask, okay, what is the adversary try to do in this situation, uh, when you have this, again, zero infinity cost. And it's gonna really depend on exactly how far apart these three points are. And they're gonna be a bunch of different cases. Um, so in the first case, if all of these points are super far away from each other, then in fact, there's nothing that the adversary can do. Uh, so if you imagine you draw an epsilon ball around each one of these three points, none of those epsilon balls intersect, then there's literally nothing the adversary can do. It can move these points around, but these classes are never going to overlap. And so the learner is going to recover the full mass. This next case is actually the opposite extreme. So in this next case, uh, essentially, all of these points are close enough together that if you look at their common barycenter, their common barycenter is less than distance epsilon away from all three. And what that means is the adversary is able to move each one of these three data points onto that black data point. As soon as that happens, all of these three points are now sitting in the same space. The learner has to make a choice at that point of which class it thinks that point belongs to. And no matter what, you're going to get some stuff wrong. So actually, because uh, the red dot is the biggest, um, essentially omega one is bigger than omega two and omega three, the best thing the learner can do is it just, it says, I give up. I'm going to say that that black point belong is the red class. And so it's going to get the green point wrong and the blue point wrong. Um, and there's just, there's nothing that any classifier can do about that. 
Okay, there are a few other cases. So maybe uh, this blue point is really far away from the other two, but those two are close enough that you can move mass onto that common barycenter. The learner is gonna be able to get the blue point correct because it's gonna say that thing's blue. But again, with that black point where we've moved the red and green on top of each other, you're either going to get red or green wrong. Um, so the learner messes up less in this case, but still uh, somewhat. Um, you can have a case like this one, where in fact, it's possible to move all of these points to their pairwise barycenters, but not the barycenter of all three. And again, uh, the learner is going to be forced to get uh, some things wrong at these black points. Okay, and uh, here's another case that's a little bit more complicated, depending on exactly what uh, these omega values are precisely. Uh, but that's not so important. Um, really, the the uh, other cases are the ones that seem to happen the most. So already with this uh, toy example of just three points, three classes, you can have all of these different things happen. The more data classes you have, the more complex things will get. Um, and you can actually relate everything to uh, essentially a simplicial complex on k points. So if you have k classes, uh, all of the different things you can do are sort of related to uh, k simplex with those points as your vertex. Um, so depending on how far away the points are from each other, maybe you can move them to barycenters along the edges or barycenters along the faces or the true barycenter of all of the points, uh, which sort of corresponds to the entire simplex uh, itself. Um, and again, that's only when each one of the individual classes is a single delta measure. And so when each one of these things is a full data distribution, which, you know, if you're working with empirical distributions, you have some big sum of uh, delta measures, you have lots of points, there's an insane amount of complication uh, that you can get here. Um, and so beyond just looking at these toy examples, uh, let's just try to understand this um, in a sort of more global way. And that's where this uh, generalized wasserstein berry Center is gonna come in. So just to recap what we learned from these toy examples and uh, the little bit of optimization we did, essentially the goal of the adversary is to move these data points from different classes on top of each other um, and they can do it if, uh, you know, these things are in some kind of overlapping epsilon balls. And the key is that the attacks that are combining a lot of points from many different classes are the most powerful attacks. Um, they're more powerful than attacks that can only combine two classes or, um, whatever. Uh, okay. All right, so let's talk about this uh, generalized wasserstein berry Center problem. So we started with uh, this problem where we have the inf over mu, the soup over S, uh, soup over F. Uh, we got rid of the Fs uh, by doing this pointwise maximization. And since this max i mu i twiddle is kind of annoying to work with, I'm just going to introduce an auxiliary, auxiliary variable lambda, which is just going to be some measure that lies above all of the mu i twiddles. Um, and we're going to just replace this max i mu i twiddle by lambda. And we get this problem where what we want to do is we want to minimize the total mass of lambda, we need to move these mu i's to the mu i twiddles, and these mu i twiddles need to lie below lambda. Um, and so since, since we're trying to minimize the total mass of lambda, uh, lambda is always going to be just this max i over the mu i twiddles. Okay, so, what does this mean? Well, this total mass of the distribution lambda, that is what corresponds to the classification accuracy that the learner gets. 
um, this is right that quantity that we've been talking about. So lambda of x is exactly that integral fi mu i summed over the i's. Um, and so what the adversary wants to do is it wants to minimize the classification accuracy lambda of x um, while being forced to transport the original data distributions mu i onto these mu i twiddles, which have to lie below lambda. And the reason that we're calling this thing a generalized Berry center problem is if, um, if I sort of didn't have that lambda there and I was minimizing uh, just this sum of the costs to transport the mu i's to the mu i twiddles, and I sort of think of each mu i twiddle as just this lambda, that is a Berry center problem because I am trying to transport distributions onto the same thing. Uh, the thing that's a little bit different here is I don't have to transport mu i onto all of lambda. Essentially, these mu i twiddles are telling me that I can transport the mu i onto part of lambda. Uh, so there's sort of this partial optimal transport structure. Um, and so again, this was kind of what I was saying. This classical wasserstein berry center problem, what you're doing is you're given a bunch of measures that have equal mass. You're given some transport cost C, and you want to choose this berry center measure nu so that the transport cost to send the mu i's to nu is as small as possible. Um, and again, what we're doing here is we have these data distributions mu. There's no reason that they have to have the same mass. You could have a lot more data in one class than another. Um, we still have this uh, transport cost C epsilon. And again, we're trying to move the mu i's to the mu i twiddles, which we can think of moving the mu i's to some part of this distribution lambda, and we want lambda to have as small mass as possible, or the adversary wants lambda to have as small mass as possible. Um, and this is sort of a picture of what's happening at a little bit of a more global scale. So um, these three distributions that are not at the center, the blue, the green, and the red, those are your input data. This thing at the center is lambda. And what we've done is we've sort of broken it into a bunch of different regions, which are corresponding to, is this part of lambda where only one class gets transported? Is it part of lambda where two classes get transported or three classes get transported? So this black part in the center is receiving data points from all three classes. That's where you're going to have three things overlapping and the learner is getting the most amount of things wrong. So in this black region, the learner can only get one third of the data correct. Um, in uh, some of these overlapping regions, the uh, purple, the light blue, and uh, there's a very small yellow region. Those are sort of two class overlapping regions where the learner is gonna get half of the info wrong. And then you have these things on the periphery which are only consisting of one class. And that's actually where the learner will get everything right. So um, again, the, the adversary is trying to overlap things as much as possible. But if you look at everything together, that's this measure lambda. Okay, so again, um, this ratio of lambda divided by the total mass of the original data, that is your classification accuracy after um, doing adversarial training. You cannot do any better than whatever this amount will be. Um, and again, the worst thing that can happen for the adversary is you just take this lambda to be the sum of all of the original uh, data distributions then your learner gets everything right. The best choice for the adversary is to actually take lambda to be the true 
Wasserstein Berry Center of all of your distributions, because that means everything completely overlaps, right? So you move everything all onto one same distribution. If you do that, the adverse, or sorry, the learner can only get one over K percentage of the data correct. Everything else has to be uh, wrong necessarily. Okay, so this worst choice is kind of what the adversary is forced to do if epsilon is super small. So if epsilon is zero, essentially there's nothing it can do. And this best choice corresponds to uh, epsilon being enormous. Um, and when you have these more intermediate values, you're kind of just caring about these vulnerable points, which are maybe close to decision boundaries between these different classes. Um, and so in some sense, when you want to do adversarial training, these two extreme cases are really bad. You don't want to choose an epsilon value that's anywhere near those. Um, you want some kind of more moderate epsilon value. Um, okay. So I've said a lot about what this optimal adversarial strategy is. Um, I think an important question then is, well, if you know the optimal adversarial strategy, can you find the optimal classifiers uh, for a given budget? Um, and the answer is yes. So uh, what, what's clear is that once you sort of have these uh, mu i stars, you know from uh, what we did when we did the pointwise maximization of these Fs that they have to concentrate on whichever one of these uh, mu twiddle stars is the biggest for a given label. That definitely has to happen. Um, but of course, uh, this thing might not be a singleton. There might be two different choices, right? That's exactly what's happening here. So I'm moving uh, two different classes on top of each other. And at the black point, uh, both the red and green classes would have the same mass. And so you would say, well, should I say that I'm red or should I say that I'm green? Or should I say that I'm some combination, right? That amount of information you don't appear to recover yet. But it turns out that actually this missing condition is given by optimal transport theory. And so it turns out that these Fi stars actually have to be Kantorovich potentials for the optimal transport of mu i to mu i star. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with optimal transport, what these Kantorovich potentials tell you is you will move mass from a point x to a point x prime, uh, essentially if and only if x prime is the minimizer of the this uh, sort of uh, some of the transport cost and these Kantorovich potentials uh, Fi. Um, okay, and uh, if you just think about this in terms of uh, say linear programming, um, this thing is like a complementary slackness condition for the problem. Um, right, so Again, if you have these uh, mu i twiddle stars, you can recover the f i stars by solving an optimal transport problem. And uh, these optimal transport problems that you have to solve are relatively easy. And there are a lot of tools out there to solve them once you have the mu i stars. Um, and so this is just essentially the, the formal statement of, um, the uh, the theorem that we proved. So um, this uh, adversarial training problem where you um, sort of do this min-max, you try to find the optimal classifier in the presence of the adversary. Whatever accuracy value you get out at the end of it is going to be equal to the total mass value that you get in this generalized barycenter problem. Okay. So in other words, when you do adversarial training, your maximal accuracy, you can figure out what that is by solving these barycenter problems. Um, and so in a sense, solving these barycenter problems gives you this benchmark for adversarial training. Um, and again, we can characterize these optimal classifiers as these Kantorovich potentials for the transport of um, 
your original data distribution to the adversarial perturbed data distribution. There is also a multi-marginal optimal transport formulation of this problem. Um, and I just mentioned that because that also has a computational tool set that uh, can be used to solve these things. Um, okay, so uh, let me just say a little bit about the, um, the consequences. So again, in this non-parametric setting, uh, adversarial training is equivalent to solving a barycenter problem. That's what the adversary needs to do. Um, you're getting a lot of geometric information that's encoded in these uh, Kantorovich potentials. And I think this is sort of one of the things that we wanna do next is to kind of understand the geometry of this problem by analyzing these Kantorovich potentials that you get out from this. Um, and again, the reason that these guys have a lot of uh, geometric information contained in them is they're precisely telling you how you should move your data distributions to the perturbed data distributions. Um, and you can also use optimal transport theory to understand regularity properties that you get for the classifiers when you do adversarial training. Um, and so for this zero infinity cost that we've been talking about, these optimal FI stars, which have to be Kantorovich potentials for this cost, they have to have this property that their upper level sets are epsilon irregular. Um, and essentially what this means is if I look at uh, some classifier, and let's just say that this is the upper level set corresponding to some value, and I look at points on the boundary, I have to be able to fit a ball of radius epsilon inside. Um, and this tells you something about how crazy this boundary can be. Because for example, uh, if you have something like a cusp, this is not going to be epsilon irregular because if I try to put a epsilon, a ball of radius epsilon inside of here, I can't do it. Um, and so these sorts of level sets are disallowed. Um, and this tells you that there's some kind of regularization happening when you do adversarial training. Your classifiers have to become nicer. Um, and another way to understand this is this sort of shape is super easy for an adversary to attack. So this is where a classifier has large value. If I have points here, the adversary can just immediately move them out of the set with almost no effort. Um, and so, yeah, that connection is, uh, I think, uh, pretty, pretty intuitive. Um, there should also be some connections to uh, higher level regularity beyond just uh, this, this epsilon inner ball property. Um, but it, it does actually give you sort of a one-sided control on the second derivatives of this shape. Um, yeah. Right, so there's, there's, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I guess it's more, there, there's essentially like stuff you always have to kind of give, give up on, right? Um, so what you can imagine is like, maybe this is what your classifier has decided to do, but maybe your real boundary is something nicer over here. And actually maybe instead of sending things out, like this is wrong and it should be classified in the other class. And now there's lots of room for all of this area to be attacked. Like the adversary sends things inside of this cusp, whereas otherwise you would only expect that it could attack like this small region here. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's, it's probably more about, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Mm, it's more complicated. So I think Nicholas, Leon, and Ryan have a paper where they show in the binary case, you can get C one one third. Uh, and essentially the issue is you can, so in the binary case, you can always find an epsilon inner regular classifier, an epsilon outer regular classifier, but they're not necessarily the same. Um, and then what you would expect is there are some regions where these two things are far away from each other. That's fine. There are some things where those two are the same. That's fine. And it's kind of like in the intermediate regions where those two meet each other that they end up getting the uh, one third instead of C11. Yeah. Yeah, so it, there's some kind of interpolation argument that loses something when you're going from those two extreme regimes. But I mean, I, I do think C11 is true. Uh, we just haven't gotten it yet. And possibly even more is true, um, depending on your initial data. Okay, so um, all of this has been for this non-parametric setting. And I think it's very valid to say, well, if most people are doing this in the case of neural nets, why should we care about this? And the reason is that this gives a universal bound on what you can do with adversarial training. And so if we have some parametric class of functions, they could be neural nets, they could be SVM or whatever, um, whatever value you get, it's going to be bounded above by solving the problem over all possible classifiers because now you're allowing the learner to choose from a larger class of functions. So you get a potentially larger value. And so this problem gives you a universal upper bound on how much classification accuracy you can get in the presence of an adversary. And it tells you something about what is possible in this accuracy robustness trade-off. Um, and the other thing I would mention is, you know, at least with neural nets, now they're so gigantic that it's also not necessarily clear that there's really any gap between the space of all probabilistic classifiers and the space of, you know, neural nets with like a trillion parameters. Um, okay, so, uh, right. I mean, we know that this thing forms a universal upper bound. Ideally, we would like to use this as a potential benchmark for uh, adversarial training in more general contexts. Um, and so we wanna know, can we actually do the computation of this um, generalized barycenter problem? And so the problem is at least this classical Wasserstein barycenter problem is known to be NP hard. And this was proven very recently. Um, and basically, uh, it, it seems like whatever you can get, it's going to be either exponential in the number of data classes you have, or it's going to be exponential in the dimension of your data. Um, and so, you know, you want to do uh, this problem in high dimensions with a large number of classes. Uh, at least this classical Wasserstein barycenter problem is going to be really hard. The advantage that we have when we're thinking about this generalized Wasserstein barycenter problem is we have this parameter epsilon, which says it's actually impossible to move certain points on top of each other. Um, the reason that this Wasserstein barycenter problem is so hard is if I just have a ton of data points, I have to, and you know, these will actually sort of correspond to different classes, even though I'm making them all the same color. Uh, I have to potentially consider uh, different K tuples of all of these points when I try to compute a barycenter, when I try to compute a Wasserstein barycenter. And you basically get a combinatorial explosion. Um, on the other hand, when epsilon is small, you can probably only consider certain pairs at a time. And what you can do is you can construct a graph where you're only connecting points that are sort of distance epsilon apart. And so you might have a graph that looks like this, um, maybe something like that. It's very, very far from being fully connected. 
And that saves you from this potential combinatorial explosion. And in general, for values of epsilon uh, that are relevant for adversarial training, you really don't expect to be able to combine everything because in that case, you're just going to get complete garbage for your classifier because it can't do anything. So in general, we're sort of interested in these, these smaller values of um, epsilon. Um, and again, un under this sort of assumption, uh, you can actually efficiently apply various um, optimal transport algorithms uh, to try to solve this problem. And the one that we sort of started with was the Sinkhorn algorithm, um, uh, which can be applied to this multi-marginal version of the problem that I mentioned um, earlier. If you've never heard of Sinkhorn before, it's just a convenient algorithm for solving very high dimensional optimal transport problems. Um, and uh, here are just a few results that um, we got. So uh, here is MNIST. Um, these graphs are uh, showing the adversarial risk. So that's sort of like one minus the classification accuracy. So here, zero is good, one is bad. Um, and uh, in this first, uh, image, the sort of distance between data points that we're using is L2. And so the adversary can move points a distance epsilon in the L2 norm. The next one is just the L infinity norm on an MNIST image itself, right? So it can move an MNIST image uh, distance epsilon in the L infinity norm. Uh, these different curves are just the Sinkhorn algorithm with uh, different parameters. So there's just this approximation parameter eta. Uh, the closer eta is to zero, the closer you are to the true optimal transport problem. So in a sense, these red curves are the uh, most relevant ones. Um, so again, these things are showing what the value of this generalized very center problem is with uh, various epsilon values. Um, and what you see uh, for MNIST is at some epsilon value, you start suddenly getting a very big spike. And essentially once you go past that value, epsilon is large enough that the adversary can combine just an insane amount of things together and you basically get garbage. And so if you think about these things as sort of benchmarks, what it's very clearly telling you is you do not wanna go past that value because then you're just going to get garbage from adversarial training. You've made your adversary way too powerful. Um, and so if you stay in sort of these uh, smaller regimes, these are much more reasonable choices for your adversarial budget when you do training. Um, and uh, it's essentially the same thing uh, with this graph of CIFAR. Again, at some point you hit this epsilon value where all of a sudden things start uh, growing really, really fast. And again, this is this is probably where you're getting into epsilon values where your perturbations are perhaps even visible to humans. Um, and again, you want to you want to stay away from those. Um, so again, these these sort of tell you two things. they They tell you how should you try to choose epsilon for these problems, or it gives you some guidance of how to choose epsilon for these problems. And it also tells you something about what kind of training loss you can expect. So as soon as you know what these curves are, you can never expect to do better when you do adversarial training on some neural net because these are universal upper bounds. Um, and uh, right, this information gives you guidance about potentially when to stop training or when it's relatively reasonable to stop training. Um, Okay, so just some uh, future directions that we're continuing um, to look at. Uh, one of the things we want to understand better is how close this sort of relaxed problem is to some of the parametric problems that we're more interested in. And this is essentially related to how regular these um, optimal classifiers will be. Uh, so, you know, there's this very interesting regularity question of given some initial data, what, um, you know, given the data of the, the classes, 
how regular can you expect these optimal classifiers to be? And that tells you something about how well they're approximated by parametric families. Um, and uh, one way that we're sort of looking at to understand that is these FKs satisfy a mon equation, which is a PDE uh, that potentially uh, contains a lot of information. Um, and uh, things are kind of complicated if you do this zero infinity cost, but you can look at it as a limit of some nicer things. Um, and uh, that's pretty much everything I wanted to say today. Uh, I'll just plug um, my paper and these papers and my collaborators that have looked at um, some of these problems from this perspective. Um, and yeah, thank you for your attention. Any questions from the audience? I have one question. Is the infinity term for top sign, but can you derive the, are you able to derive the cumulus conclusion to be different at all? Yeah, so it's like, as you change your cost, it's like, you're just solving a Berry Center problem with a different cost. Um, but essentially, if you, if you don't choose an infinity of Wasserstein distance, you choose something like W2 instead, you make the adversary a little bit too powerful. Um, so the, the infinity distance is kind of important to um, sort of get what you want out of the training process. Otherwise, the adversary just kind of completely beats the classifier and you don't really get anything out of this. Yeah. And, and from, from the graph, how do you measure the, the adversary of this? What was the... What, what was oh, um, here? Yeah. Yeah, so the these graphs are just like one minus the value of um, the generalized Berry Center problem. So it's like you solve the generalized Berry Center problem yeah, you subtract. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you mentioned if you look at a parametric family, this is a universal upper bound. Yeah. But if you have a parametric family that's a convex set of functions, you can still swap the yes. infant soup. Yeah. And you could try to analyze that. Right. Have you have you thought about that? Um, not in this case. I think Nicholas might have looked at the binary case with like linear classifiers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, there's there's been work that's I think showing that you even have a, like, like adversarial um, examples in linear classification. Uh -huh. too. So this could be interesting. Yeah. 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 But yeah, we haven't really looked at it for this stuff. Um, and then in maybe the previous plot with MNIST, I'm just curious why the L infinity norm has these plateaus. I think probably like with the L infinity norm, you're like literally able to completely change pixel values everywhere. And so uh, there's probably some amount of changing the pixel value where you don't do very much, but then all of a sudden you hit some new value, right? Where you could like almost create totally new white pixels, right? So these these are the pixel values like for on the x axis. So yeah, you, essentially. You go to 255 in your MNIST. Yeah, right. And it's like once you hit 255. So once you once you get even to to. Yeah, once you get to 220 or 140 or something. Yeah. To pretty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so does this does this give you anything any any useful information at the much smaller? epsilons that are not perceptible to the yeah i mean like i think that's where it's potentially more where you can imagine that the adversary is is sort of doing attacks that are maybe changing like a five into a six All right i guess maybe with the l infinity that's not but with l2 these smaller values right maybe you're able to do things like change a five into a six or change very similar uh, I guess we did, yeah, so like maybe four to six. Um, but I, I think with like a neural net, it's it's potentially different because under the hood, it could be doing something so crazy that, you know, a tiny little change really 
uh, affects things a lot. Right, the idea yeah. is it doesn't actually look like it. Right, like exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that the, the noise is chosen in such a way right. that it tricks the classic part. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Okay. And there's nothing on Zoom. Okay, well then we'll thank Matt again for his talk. Um, and if you guys want, if uh, any students want to join, there's um, a meeting uh, just over in the conference room here after the talk um, to meet with Matt. Thank you. This was interesting. <laughs> I need to think a little bit about it. Um, yeah, I'll be curious to look at your slides. Yeah. Happy to if send them along. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I have to run to another talk. So. Yeah. No worries. Nice meeting. Yeah, you too. that maybe um, is a, yeah,